everyone. I just want to make sure we're live. I'll just do a live check. Alex, are we are we good? Not yet. Uh, if you do a refresh, it might show up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. We are live. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Zoe Alexandra, and I am starting a, an in, I hope, an interesting vlog uh, for homeopaths and, and, and lay people who are interested in learning more about homeopathy. And um, tonight I have an amazing guest. Kim Alia is with me tonight. Kim is a fantastic teacher. He teaches around the world. He's also the CEO of Whole Health Now. And he is a principal instructor and developer of a four-year classical homeopath homeopathy program at the he Hanuman Academy in Tokyo and Osaka, Japan. And he teaches homeopathy, again, around the world. He is currently working on an exciting new project. It's a film titled Introducing Homeopathy. So I, I know we can't hear you applaud, but thank you, Kim, for being with us today. I'm so excited you're able to join me. Oh, and thank, you. thank you, Zoe. It's my pleasure. I'm really happy to be here. And thank you, thank you, Ruby. Welcome, Kim. So I, um, I don't know if you can see the uh, chats, but uh, I'll, I'll let you know as they come up. And if you have any questions, um, I'll just start with, what made you uh, decide to become a homeopath? That's a great question. So many, many years ago, I was the director of nutrition at Hardwood Institute in Northern California, and I had quite a number of people I was working with on a nutritional basis. Um, but I was looking for some other type of therapeutic modality because, as you know, if people are already eating really well, uh, oftentimes it's only so much that you can do. You know, they're already chewing their buckwheat sprouts 6,000 times per mouthful. So, you know, it's limited in terms of what you're able to advise them on. And I went into a local health food store and there was a book there by Maisie Panos. And it was on the uh, homeopathic treatment of first aid in acute conditions. And I picked up the book. And I looked at the back cover of the book, and on the back cover was a quote by Mahatma Gandhi that said that, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it says something like, you know, homeopathy cures a far larger percentage of cases and is the most cost-effective system of medicine in the world. And I was really struck by that quote because I knew that Gandhi had wanted people from the Indian subcontinent to have pride in their own accomplishments. And there's a very old system of therapeutics there called Ayurveda, thousands of years old, and somehow he's recommending homeopathy over Ayurveda. I thought, how is this possible? And so I, I purchased that book. I, I brought it home. I read the whole book that evening. And because I already had people I was working with on a nutritional basis, I began to give out remedies fairly rapidly. And that was really my introduction to homeopathy and how I, I started. Oh, fantastic. Um, yeah, that's... Um... It's quite a story because it's uh, it is interesting how you can work on somebody's nutrition and this uh, it doesn't take care of everything but uh, homeopathy can really make um, well clear the layers and and, and uh, help if if just nutrition isn't enough so um, that's, that's it, the two of them work together beautifully that's the bottom line really nutrition and homeopathy yeah now. I'm wondering, because I think that childhood upbringing has a lot, not everything because we all come in with our own personalities and uh but um our upbringing can often uh shape us and because two different people coming across that book um and both could be in nutrition maybe you know one won't won't bother to take it anywhere so i'm always curious as to the upbringings of people and why why you um because it might sh have shaped why you decided to go further and uh so would you mind telling us a little bit about <laughs> that's a great great question so um well, I mean, the truth of the matter is I had a very difficult mom. She was she was a real challenge. She was bitter, angry, unforgiving. I mean, like if she would get mad at me, she wouldn't talk to me for like six months at a time. And um, when I got older and I started studying homeopathy, I was actually visiting with my parents in Geneva, Switzerland. And I was reading at the time George Vitolkos' Stolen Essences. Somebody had taken notes from one of his conferences at Esalen and had published it as a book. And I was reading through it. And I got to the remedy, nitricum acidum. And it was as if George Vitolkos personally knew my mom and was simply describing her in that book. And I knew enough about homeopathy at that point to ask a few confirmatory questions. So I went to my mom and I said, I said, mom, how do you feel about herring? Not the famous American homeopath, Constantine herring, but, but pickled herring. And she said, oh, I love it. 
And I thought, <laughs> okay, perfect. You know, I mean, this is the perfect match, nitric acid for my mom. And so I gave her nitric acid 6C four times a day. Now, I wouldn't do that now because of um, a particular aphorism in the organon, aphorism 247. But I was unfamiliar with aphorism 247 at the time. So I gave her nitric acid 6C four times a day. And my mom went through a miraculous transformation. She went from this bitter, angry, unforgiving, literally impossible human being to someone who was literally singing and dancing around the house. And I I remember my, you know, there's the old saying, you, 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 know, you can't be a prophet in your own hometown. Like, you know, if you have a, a business idea when you're 35 and you share it with your parents and they say, well, you, you tried to start, start a lemonade stand when you were four and it didn't work out. And you, but I'm 35 and that was four. And, you know, and I, and I kind of had that dynamic with my dad where he didn't really have great confidence in my ability abilities in life. And, you know, but after he witnessed the transformation of my mom, he was so amazed. He, he shook my hand. He said, I don't know what you've done. But from <laughs> now on, I support you 100%. And um, I, re I know it's not quite answering your question, but it all kind of relates because if I had known about Omiyabi when I was a kid, I would have saved myself a lot of headaches in, in my later life. So I, and, you know, I also treated my father for a prostate issue and he was cured and didn't have to get surgery. And my, and you have to realize my dad was ready to divorce my mom. He was so fed up with her. And because of her literal transformation, uh, they never ended up getting divorced. And I remember even one night we were all around, the whole family was around the dinner table and we were, we got to some debate about something or other. And we started arguing and my mom just looked at us and said, Oh, just forget about it. And everyone like turned to say, who is this? You know? And so <laughs> it was just a, a profound, incredible transformation. Uh, and I love to share that story because yeah, homeopathy can treat your first aid problems and your acute conditions and even very serious chronic health problems. But it can also fundamentally transform a person's life on all levels. And that's what I witnessed with my mom. I also witnessed the same thing with my daughter later on. She was very shy and kind of um, introspective. And I, I gave her Burrita Carbonic and she totally opened up and was, you know, singing in front of her, you know, classmates in the auditorium and all of her her family's uh, all of her friends' parents were calling me up and saying, you know, can you can you do the same thing for our kid? You know? So um so I think, you know, the difficult life I had as a child uh, really set me up for wanting to explore how to grow as a person and how to help other people grow and to transcend the challenges that we all face in life. And for me, homeopathy has been a really amazing gift in that respect. You know, it's given me a tool to make a real difference in other people's lives. And I, if, if I've learned anything in the 62 years that I've been on this planet is that if you wanna be happy, help others, you know, serve others. If, you, if you're if you always thinking about yourself and the price of coffee, you're, you're never gonna be happy. But if you forget about all that stuff and you think about how can I help my fellow beings on this planet, how can I serve them? You, you discover that you're, you, find, uh, you find a path that leads to happiness. Oh, I love it. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Life can be, um, a friend of mine actually said life is, life is hard. And I, I, I don't want to look at it that, that uh, darkly or negatively, but uh, it is, it, it, we go through trying times and uh, homeopathy can really help. And to give that gift uh, to others is, you know, there's nothing more rewarding, really. Yeah. yeah. I just, you know, it's a uh, yeah, beautiful transformation with your mom, though. I think that's just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it really is. I remember even later on, like, you know, when she got really old, because she lived to the age of 94, you know, she'd call me on the phone and, you know, she'd go, I love you so much. And I'd always look into the phone and think, like, who is this person? You know, it's like, so. <laughs> Why couldn't you be there when I was born? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know what you might you, you, uh, just uh, did did uh, she notice a difference? It's, I'm always curious. Oh, I don't know if she really noticed. You know, everyone else around her noticed. She was just being herself, you know, and but she was happy, you know. Whereas before, she wasn't happy. You know, she was really miserable. Oh. And uh, you know, it it it, it goes back to that uh, aphorism nine, the lofty goal of human existence. Homeopathy does a tremendous amount, including you know, fundamentally changing a person's life. You know, you get that right remedy. It's pretty incredible. Oh yeah, it's amazing. It's uh, just to see it, just to see the shadow or whatever is holding a person back that they just can't seem to grow out of. You know, it's uh, it's yeah. beautiful to watch. But um, yeah, I'm glad. Uh, I, what a lovely story. Now uh, I'll move on to the next one because I think you almost you didn't quite answer that one, but I'm kind of guessing which <laughs> way you might be going on it. So many um, homeopaths, uh, like homeopaths are, are somewhat split. 
Uh, there's some homeopaths believe that you really should never self-treat, um, that you should always go to an external homeopath. And, I'll, and many homeopaths also believe that, you know, you should self-treat. It's um, so I won't put any of my uh, thoughts on that in there. I'll just ask you, what are you, what do you think? Well, about? I think it really depends. Uh, I think if you have the ability to be self-aware, you know, Hahnemann talks about this in his seminal work, seminal, seminal article called The Medical Observer, where he talks about the fact that very few of us really have the ability to perceive clearly the world around us and also really ourselves. But if you have developed that ability to discriminate and to really see yourself honestly, I do think you can prescribe for yourself. Although I think in most cases, you're probably better off going to another individual to get remedies just because they're able to be uh, more objective and stand back from the situation. They can also um, look at you in a way that, you know, you're used to being a certain way and you may not see certain patterns in yourself. So I think if you if you have the opportunity to work with a really accomplished, well-trained homeopathic practitioner, I think for the most part, that's probably the best, but I'm sure that there are many practitioners out there who self-prescribe and, you know, could get good results. Um, I know for myself that I've always sought out the assistance of other practitioners and uh, except when I recently had cholera where I was so sick, I literally couldn't pick, even pick up the phone and know who to call. Um, I was able to uh, determine the best remedy at, at that time. I, I was down in Mexico and uh, we ate some food. It was probably contaminated. And I, I flew back to the uh, to the United States. And shortly afterwards, um, I was all alone in my home and I got really, really sick. And I had the pathognomonic symptom of cholera, which is rice water stools. That's how you, you diagnose it. And uh, so I knew I had cholera, and but I was really sick. I mean, diarrhea and terrible vomiting. And I took a, a few different common remedies for cholera, like uh, arsenicum and uh, camphora. I think I took veratrum album. None of them did anything at all. And then I um, I thought of Athusa synapium, fool's parsley. And I ended up taking that remedy, and it was dramatic. I mean, my symptoms abated almost instantaneously. And uh, so that there's an instance where, you know, I did have to, I was forced to self-prescribe because I wasn't in a position to even be able, I could barely even dial the, I couldn't even see the numbers. I was so sick, you know. So I don't even know how I got to my, found my remedy kit to pull the remedy out. <laughs> so. Well, it helps. Um, I, I, uh, yeah, if you can see yourself clearly on the chronics, but on the acutes, I think it's um, generally a little easier because you're not, you might see, a, a, you know, an emotional change or a mental emotional change, uh, you know, so like if you're, <laughs> if you're all, if you're all of a sudden you get a high fever, you're like, let me wash the floors, you might want to look at arsenicum. Yeah, yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, you're you're not going to be you're not going to be prejudiced about your acute patterns as much as you might be with your chronic patterns. But the thing is, oftentimes if you're really really sick, you know, you're sometimes just too sick to be able to figure out what to do. Even you know, so I think that's the challenge there. Yeah, that is, especially if you if you're uh, if you've got a really high fever and you're not seeing clearly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, so no, that's I'm glad you came through that. Uh, it's just, it's interesting, but um, you did have a lot of treatment of your family. So I was guessing you didn't go the other way on that question, but it's, it's, uh, but treating people around you so you can see the effects and that's. Uh, that's yeah. So, some people say you shouldn't treat your own family, but I've had really good results uh, um, treating my family, my, both my parents, my daughter, uh, even my wife at various times. So she recently had, um, was sick and she had these pains in her uh, she had an acute condition she had these pains shooting pains on the left side of her head and i give her spigalia and instantaneously you know went away. And she was she she only believes in homeopathy for about 20 minutes after i give her a remedy and it works and then she forgets you know. so um so she was good for another 20 minutes after that it's funny how that sometimes happens <laughs> you know? oh great thank you and but only in an acute Oh my gosh, I can't take it anymore. Condition. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm really only joking. She she really does she really does believe in homeopathy. She's seen enough of my patients to see the results. <laughs> I have a question, so I'll, I'll I'll go to this quickly now. Um, so thank you, RN Homeo, for uh, for posting the question. Did Hanneman self prescribe? I wonder, did Mel Melanie prescribe for him as he got older? Uh. Well, Hahnemann didn't take too many remedies, but he did a lot of provings. And I think it's aphorism 130 or 131 where he talks about uh, doing a proving upon yourself. And as long as you're, you know, a good observer, you know, the the 
the uh, unprejudiced observer, he talks about how you could, you're the, actually the best person to do approving on is yourself. And so, um, and he does even say at a certain point that because he did all these provings, he, he lived a very long life and a very, and a relatively healthy one. I mean, he was, he did get acute, some things of that nature, but he really didn't have any um, serious chronic health problems. Matter of fact, probably most people know who are, uh, who are trained as homeopaths that he uh, felt that almost everybody out there had Sora except for himself, which was what allowed him to perceive Sora in others. So, um, uh, so yeah, I think that they would give remedies and especially he did a lot of provings. So they would take remedies on themselves quite a bit. Yeah. I, I find it's interesting that if, if, um, uh, if you try something out and uh, you have a pretty major reaction to it, then you know what, that feels like, you know, if you're treating your own patients. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. If you take Nexomica and, and you become extremely constipated and irritable and you're driving down the street at 72 miles an hour screaming at everybody for everybody to get out of your way, that's a visceral experience of Nexomica that you can't really get by reading the description of it in the Materia Medica. There's no question. Yeah. I'm going to say, uh, uh, Gam88888, thank you. It, yeah, it is amazing how effectively and quickly acute remedies do take effect. It's just, uh, and when you nail it, and if you don't nail it, it's not, it, you know, you might see a little bit of an improvement, but you're not, when you really nail it, it's just really, really quick, which is amazing. So that's, you know, sp speaks to uh, cholera. I just, you're, I think you're the only person I know who actually has had cholera, which is pretty yeah. amazing. Yeah, it's not, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend it to anybody, I can tell you. No, no, I don't think that would be good at all. <laughs> it's not a, it's not an easy condition, but anyway, <laughs> I survived it just fine. Good, I'm glad. Thank goodness. <laughs> so, um, we'll go on to the next question. I wanted to know, uh, are there any books that you have read, homeopathic or otherwise, which greatly enhanced your understanding of homeopathy and ability to treat more effectively? Because there's some books that just the light go goes on. I. It, well, I mean, honestly, for me, the Organon's probably been the most important of all the books that are out there. Uh, you know, Adolf Lippe, who many people consider to have been the greatest homeopathic prescriber who ever lived, they called him the Ajax of homeopathy, like that Greek general, he would drive into battle and defeat all of his foes. And in 50 years of busy practice, Lippe never lost one typhoid cholera or malaria patient 50 years and you got to realize this is during a period of time when the mortality rate of these diseases is 40 50 60 percent he never lost a case well this great prescriber lippe read the organ on twice a year for 50 years and after 50 years he said i'm now just beginning to fully understand the organ on it. And that really gives you a sense of the depth of genius contained in that work which is not immediately understandable until you've actually been in practice for a while. It really is an, an outline of exactly how to practice homeopathic medicine. So, you know, that's probably the first and foremost work. Of course, his other associated writings, chronic diseases, there's, um, and, and then the other thing I would really recommend is a lot of the old journals. Uh, for example, the Organon Journal, which ran from 1878 through 1881, that's got these wonderful series uh, called the, the Fatal Flaw series by Lippe. Brilliant. Uh, you know, that, that whole 1,800 pages of those journals is just pure gold. Uh, the uh, uh, International Hanumania Association Transactions, again, wonderful writings. The Homeopathic Recorder, the Homeopathic Physician, the Medical Advance. These old journals, which really go into how to practice homeopathy with, you know, wonderful little clinical tips on, you know, different methods of practice and philosophy. Uh, this is what I would recommend that somebody who's really serious about homeopathy, really delving deeply into it and really investigating on a on a very profound and, and thorough level, because I think you'll find an immense amount of wisdom and intelligence. I, I, the one work I, I wish was available in English is Staff's Archive, uh, Johann Ernest Staff, which was one of Hahnemann's early students. Uh, uh, Gustav Wilhelm Gross and Johann Ernest Staff were the two students that uh, Hahnemann first shared his theory of the chronic diseases with. And Staff was the uh, editor of the very first homeopathic journal, but unfortunately, it's never been translated out of German. So, um, you know, if you're not a German, and the German of that time was also very different from the contemporary German. So, you you know, you really would have to spend a lot of time to understand and read it. Uh, but if that could be translated in English, I think that would be a, a rich source of wonderful information about homeopathy. Oh, that would be lovely. We just have to find out if we know some some people who are good German translators and know old German. 
<laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, you know, I understand, Zoe, that old German of that time is more different uh, to contemporary German than is Shakespearean English to contemporary English. So that gives you a sense of how much the language has evolved over the last 150 uh, or so years. No, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah I've, I've, um, yeah, I've, I've looked at old Italian, so not old German, but yet when you're looking at it, it's can, you know, you have no idea <laughs> what it means because, <laughs> you know, because it's, it's a, yeah, you, you really need. Well, that. yeah, and Italian is a very interesting example because Italian was a language that was largely created by one individual, you know, Dante Alighieri took all of these different dialects and put them together and created the Italian language. And so that language has been, has persisted quite well, I don't know what 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 year were you talking about the Italian being? I used to sing opera, so uh, ah. when I had to read the scores, I had to really go and look to say, okay, what does this really mean? Because some things change over time, and um, you know, I guess even when you're looking at the English language, new new terms come into being, and it's just uh, sure, of yeah. course, always, always, yeah, yeah. But it was, uh, yeah, but it was quite uh, quite uh, interesting, challenging, and and fun. But I really would love to to see uh, more of the older works and, and you know of staff. If that could be translated, it would be amazing. Just because even um, thinking of a, a case with a, a varicose vein pain, it was uh, um, it was actually uh, James Compton Burnett's one of his uh, one of his. Well, he did a he did actually a little book on it, and I just read through it, and I'm like, oh, Farron Foss. Oh, great! That's great. And it, and it was I, like. I'm sorry to ask you, but are you an opera singer? I used to sing opera. Yeah, I used oh, to. Oh, wow. Well, we'll have to talk more. At some other time, we'll have to talk more about that. <laughs> I'm a big opera fan, so that's great. Oh, wow. I love it. Okay, yeah. yes, we yeah. will have to talk more about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, so, yeah, I almost went off on a long tangent, but our, our Nehemiah Pass, watching this will be thinking, no, Zoe, no, don't, don't do it. <laughs> Oh, that'll be great to chat about that. Um, but what, we'll, you know, move on to more homeopathy. Okay, sounds good. So if you were to, to thank you for the recommendation, I think you almost answered that, but are there any online training manuals or, or, or books, if you could say two, they'd say definitely look look at, like you would definitely want people to read to actually enhance their, their uh, capabilities? Well, in terms of Materia Medica, I really like uh, George Vitolkis's Materia Medica Viva. It's not completed, unfortunately. Uh, I think he's only up to the letter I in English. I hope he finishes it. I'm not sure that he will, but I really appreciate uh, that way of writing Materia Medica for two reasons. One is it paints a picture of the of the the remedy uh, and the patients that we're going to need it, and I think that's very useful. But more, even more important than that, it's based really on clinical experience. It's based on his own cases, on the cases of the many medical doctors that he supervised, and also many cases from the old literature. And to me, a clinical materia medica makes the most sense. And, I, you know, of course, provings are invaluable. Hahnemann clearly states in Aphorism 108 that there's no reliable way to know about the medicinal action of a remedy without conducting a proving on it. But from what I understand, and this is something that was shared with me by Franz Vermeulen, is that maybe 25 or 30 percent of the information that comes in provings is never verified in clinical practice. And there is information in our materia medica, which we are even, which we recognize as keynotes of remedies, which is not in the proving. A perfect example of that is the very famous symptom of phosphorus, where you know you the, the person wants to drink some cold water and then the cold water warms up in their stomach and then they vomit it back up again. Well, that particular keynote of phosphorus was not in the original proving. It was a symptom that was discovered actually during a cholera epidemic. Adolf Lippe was treating a patient. He decided based on the totality of the characteristic symptoms of the case that the person needed phosphorus. The patient had that symptom, but he didn't prescribe based on that symptom. He gave phosphorus, he cured the patient, that symptom went away. And then subsequently it was discovered to be a common symptom associated with phosphorus. So there's a perfect example of a symptom which wasn't in the original proving, and many of the symptoms that are in the original proving may never be seen in clinical practice. So if you can create a materia medica based on clinically verified information, to me, that's going to be the most reliable in a clinical setting, in, a, in an actual real practice. So uh, that's one of the reasons I like the materia medica viva so much. I think it's a, a really brilliant work. Uh, in terms of courses, I think that Whole Health Now has a tremendous assortment of different courses. And, you know, we've got almost 2,600 hours worth of courses on our website at this point. And there's a lot of them that I could recommend. One of the more recent ones that I really like a lot is the work of George Yurge. He's a Romanian homeopath. 
and he's combined homeopathy and semiotics together. And his work is absolutely brilliant. I mean, he's able to observe patterns and movements in the patient and their hand gestures and things that, you know, most of us are not trained to really observe carefully. And I think the integration of those two really makes a lot of sense. And I think he, you know, demonstrates through video cases, the tremendous success he has treating uh, children and adults uh, using homeopathy. So I think that would be another recommendation. I mean, there's so many good things that are out there. I, I don't even know where to start, but um, uh, anything by any of the work of George Dimitriotis, I think is is really worthwhile pursuing. I think he's brilliant. Andre Sane is another really important, uh, very erudite scholarly practitioner of homeopathy. Um, I tend to lean towards the people who are more orthodox in their approach that are more uh, oriented towards a Hahnemannian type of a methodology. But, uh, you know, there's some interesting new ideas on the horizon as well. Um, the polarity therapy by Heiner Fries, very interesting methodology. So there's a lot of interesting things out there. I, I, I love the idea that Lippe was reading uh, the Organon, though. So it's just, uh, yeah, if you get, it's a reminder. <laughs> I'm going, I'm starting to reread stuff now that I've been in practice for a bit. And, you know, I read it, I think, uh, before I even went to school, I read some good textbooks. And yeah, and when you, you reread it, because reading it is not the same as being in practice. And then you you have a review and it's like you catch a lot more information or valuable information. You take in a lot more valuable information that you weren't aware of the first time. So it's uh, yeah, the the, uh, the uh, homeopathic or the Hanumanian principles are, are, uh, are quite helpful. You know, if you go, if you go back to it, I have to, I have to go back to reading the Organon again, uh, but I'm doing the textbooks first. Just, uh, as a <laughs> I, I hear it. Well, it was, if it was good for Lippe, it's gotta be good for the rest of us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And um, you know, one, one thing I'll, I'll say is, you know, one of the, the difficulties that people have when they're reading the organ on is that the sentences are tend to be very long. And people, especially these days when, you know, everything's been truncated to a significant degree, they have difficulty with the attention span, keeping their train of attention. So I oftentimes tell my students to go back and read the writings of Edgar Allan Poe or Washington Irving or James Fenimore Cooper, who were writers in the early 19th century who also had very long sentence structures or Alexander Hamilton, you know, in, uh, in the Federalist Papers. And, you know, just that reading of those types of writings will acclimate you to being able to read the organ on more easily, I think. Well, that's interesting. Um, so that's, uh, no, that's great advice. I just hadn't even thought of that. Um, it's it's difficult reading until you've been in it. I have to say, when I first started to, to learn it, uh, to learn about homeopathy, I went to the library, I looked at it, and I just read about, you know, one and a half pages and thought, I have no idea, <laughs> no idea. But, yeah. uh, but, you know, I hadn't gone to school at that point, and I'd, I'd never seen a book like that. So that was sure, <laughs> a sure. wake-up call. But, yeah, no, that's a that's a great suggestion. And, um, yeah, breaking it up because long sentences, it is hard. We do we do like to keep them short and sweet, and we, we tend to remember much more easily now. And we've got that, you know, take away three points that everybody basically goes by. And then, right, right. Right, right. Yeah. Um, now – Okay, now I'm going to ask you to describe a very difficult case you had and what helped you solve it, including principles of homeopathy, training, and re or readings. I know we've, you know we've got a lot of the easier cases, or the ca and they might actually, you know what, they might not be easy. We just happen to do it well from initially, but sometimes we've got those challenging cases which really aren't, uh, which can be difficult for a number of reasons. And, and what, what um, if you can think of one and what helped you solve it, and and because uh, it is really an well, let me share a couple of cases. There's one interesting case. I was uh, invited to lecture at the Czech summer school in the Czech Republic a number of years ago. And it's, 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 a, it's an arduous task because you teach for eight straight days, like, you know, 10 hours a day. So it's like 80 hours worth of teaching. There's like hardly any breaks. And it's, it's a pretty exhausting uh, uh, <laughs> thing to do. But, uh, you know, I was invited and, and I love the Czech Republic. And so I went out there and they asked me to teach on three different topics. Uh, asthma, uh, the bowel nozodes, and the um, therapeutic pocketbook repertory by Clemens von Maria Berninghausen. 
And I started with the therapeutic pocketbook repertory and, you know, I started talking about the value of the repertory and this and that. And I could see, you know, there were a couple hundred people in the audience. I could see from their faces that they were not happy that, you know, why is this guy talking about this book that was published in 1846? You know, we want the new ideas and the novel things and the new remedies. And this book is antiquated and ancient and unnecessary. And, but, you know, I know the value of the therapeutic pocketbook repertory. So I persisted and I kept going. And on the second day, I started talking about uh, one-sided cases, you know, one-sided cases, cases where there's a paucity of symptoms in the case, and also uh, mental cases. And during the lunch break on the second day, a woman came up to me, and she showed me this photograph of her daughter. It was terrible. She had this terrible impetigo. It was like, like her whole right cheek. I could show you a photo, but I have to find it. Um, the whole right cheek was completely destroyed, scabbed up, ulcerated with blisters on the outside. And um, she had given like, she was a fairly accomplished practitioner herself. She'd been practicing for like 25 years and she'd given like seven or eight remedies, graffitis and sulfur and tuberculinum and basilinum and none of the remedies had done anything. And she said, um, can you help my daughter, please? And I said, well, why don't I take the case in front of the class? So we put the photo up in front of the class and I said, well, let's use the therapeutic pocketbook repertory because everybody was very you know, skeptical about this book from 1846. So I put it up and there weren't a lot of symptoms in the case. It really was a kind of a one-sided case. There was the ulceration in the center with blisters on the outside. There was a uh, worse touch, but Jesus, I mean, how could you not think it would be worse touch? It was worse opening the mouth again. That's really not particularly useful. It was worse at night. And it had, there was these crawling sensations. Now I can tell you, if you use a contemporary post Kentian type of repertory, you're going to come up with dozens and dozens of remedies that will cover all of those five symptoms. But the therapeutic pocketbook repertory only has 125 remedies. It's much more, uh, uh, controlled and also the information is extremely reliable in terms of what's well, actually been put in there. And so when we used just those five rubrics in the therapeutic pocketbook repertory, only one remedy came up, Mercurius. I opened up chronic diseases. I showed them the passages in, in chronic diseases about Mercurius that fit her case perfectly. I said, Mercurius is the remedy to give. And I think they were still a little bit skeptical, but uh, they said, okay. Uh, we, I said, what potency they made very suggestions i said well this is a very rapidly aggressively growing condition it's it's moving from her her right cheek to her left cheek we need to act quickly i would suggest just a 30 c one dose but then give a, a dose every hour in solution succussing between each of the doses uh they didn't happen to have a 30 c on hand they had an 18 c so i said okay start with the 18 c get the 30 and switch over as soon as you get it after the very first dose of 18C, immediately the impetigo stopped spreading, immediately. Wow. And within, uh, within 60 hours, so two and a half days, and I should show you the photographs because it's shocking, this terrible, disgusting, you know, corroded, broken up, scabby, ulcerated right cheek was completely normal. I mean, it was just a little bit of redness. Now, the reason that that's so amazing is theoretically your skin should not be able to regenerate that quickly. Of course, she was young. I think she was like 11 or 12. So, of course, her life force is very strong. But even so, this is almost unexplainable. And yet everyone was able to witness firsthand the dramatic transformation by just giving, you know, a few doses of mercury. Of course, they immediately went out and bought the therapeutic pocketbook repertory. So... Um, <laughs> So that's one case I can think of. Another one that I can think of is a case where the patient came in, an elderly woman, and she had like every health issue that you could imagine. She had neurological issues. She had a fatty liver, a fatty pancreas. She had no gallbladder. She had no appendix. So, you know, she's missing organs. She has congestive heart failure. She has diabetes. She has sciatica. I mean, she like, you know, you go through a pathology textbook and she's got like every disease in every chapter. and you know, the first thought that comes to your mind is how much can I help a person like this? You know, because she's missing organs and some of the organs that are still there are, are you know, they're not functional. They're fatty and, 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 uh, and compromised. Anyway, I took the case and um, there was a lot of liver symptoms. 
and she had this pain that uh, went from the, uh, the the liver area up to the right scapula or close to the right shoulder, maybe not exactly the right scapula. That's a keynote of a particular remedy. And she was also very, very guilty. And this remedy tends to be have a lot of anxiety about conscience, especially it's the type of guilt where they feel they're being forsaken by God. You know, it's the same type of guilt that you see in a remedy like Kelly Bramatum, you know, where they it's not just your, your average day-to-day -day guilt, but it's like you're being forsaken by God himself. And so, of course, that matches the remedy. You probably know it, Chelidonium. Yes. And um, so I, I, you know, I didn't know how much progress we could make, but I gave, started giving her Chelidonium 6C and solutions to custom between each of the doses, uh, as is suggested in the fifth and sixth editions of the Organon. And she really did amazing. I mean, on the second and third intake, she was significantly better. Uh, her, her pain went completely away. Uh, I mean, it was quite unbelievable i was myself quite surprised I, even though i've witnessed for decades now the power of homeopathy to see something like that is just you know you you still hardly can believe it yourself um she did eventually pass away a couple of years later but what was amazing about that is she was not suffering mm -hmm. and i always like to remind people that you know we're all going to die we're we are mortal beings and we have this particular period of time available to us and we should do the most with our lives contribute the most that we can for this generation and for future generations but we're going to at the end of all uh, everything we're going to we're going to pass on to whatever whatever is there in the next realm and so one of our jobs as homeopaths is not just to cure the sick but to also eliminate or mitigate their suffering and that was one of the gifts of that particular case for me is that she did end up passing on because she was a, such a sick person, but she was able to do it in a graceful way with dignity and without having to suffer uh, in terrible pain at the end of her life. And did that, did that help her feeling that she was no longer uh, forsaken by God? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Her emotional state changed quite significantly. As well. That's, that's beautiful because that I think is uh uh, physical pain on the way out, but just to feel that lifted must have, uh, yeah. I guess, that, that, I mean, that's, they're tied together anyway, but it's just. Abs absolutely. Yeah. No question about it, Tilly. Yeah. That's what I I, I have to say. Um, and, and Shireen, yes. Wow. Excellent. Shireen says, <laughs> I don't know if you can see the uh, the uh, chat, Kim, but uh, yeah, it's, um, and uh, yes, thank you, Ruby. It is, it is lovely, but uh, it's, I think one of the bone, the benefits and, and the blessings of homeopathy is that, you know, you can, alleviate at the mental emotional level as well as the physical and if you if you do, do the right intake and you know you'll be looking at both anyway and it's just uh rewarding to see so it's um that's a beautiful story and i, I wasn't sure if you're going to go to miraculously recovered because sometimes <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean there, there are those stories you know people literally like not breathing and you give them carbo veg and they, yes. boom, they, you know, they, they come out of it and stuff but uh yeah no, that no. The reality is that's usually not what happens. And yes, we all we all must uh, pass on at some point or another. But to to yeah. live live as joyfully and pain free and uh, um, at peace as we possibly can. That's that's a blessing in of itself. Um, yeah. so I'm going to go to the um, next question. Okay, so the um, this depends on which country which country uh, somebody who's practicing homeopathy is living in because and and even which which uh province or state etc because it's you know in india they have full hospitals and in north america or basically and even in the uk mainly it's uh solo practitioners so what would you give and i i think it'd be more the solo practitioners um advice on what would you actually or either if you want to do both what what advice would you give to help practitioners avoid some common missteps when they're beginning their own practice well i would say more I would say the most important thing is to really study the art and science of homeopathy and to really master it. You know, um, don't think that you know enough about homeopathy at any point. I'm always studying it, even after what is it now, 36, 37 years that I've been doing this, because it's a, it's a vast field and there's always new things to learn. So I would go back and I'd read those old journals. I would read the organ on every year, at least once, if not twice a year. Um, I would uh, always strive to do the best for your patients. I think that's the most important thing. And um, I'd also be really careful about what you're doing. I'll, I'll just share a story. When I was early in my practice, 
a patient came to see me and he was suicidal. And uh, I took his case and it seemed pretty clear that he needed the remedy natrum sulfuricum, which is one of the remedies that we do think about for people who are, are suicidal. And I gave him the remedy and did a follow-up a month later and he came back and he was doing great. He said, oh, I don't have any suicidal feelings at all. And, you know, I'm doing wonderful. And because I was still a novice, I said, fantastic. Well, there's no need for you to come back and see me again. Just give me a call, you know, if you, um, you know, if you need to see me again. And many, many months went by, six, seven, eight months went by. And I got a phone call from his wife. And she had had the canceled check that he had written to me. And I guess he had committed suicide. And, you know, she went through this whole interrogation process. And um, I was pretty freaked out at the time, you know, uh, about like what repercussions there would be. Nothing actually ended up happening. But it, it really taught me a lesson that you really need to be uh, in touch with your patients, especially those who are really chronically sick. You know, I, I give people my email address, my patients, and they communicate with me on a regular basis. And I want to know how they're doing, you know. Uh, so I want to stand, especially for people who are very, very sick or people who have mental and emotional health issues. You want to be sure to stay in close contact with them. Uh, they, things can happen in life that can disrupt the action of the remedy. You know, uh, they could have a particular stress. You know, for Hahnemann, the thing that he says most often causes an antidote of a remedy is what he calls vexation. Well, what is vexation? Vexation is stress, you know, and we're, and we're all under stress, especially these days, you know, in, in, in the world that we're living in right now, it's hard not to be stressed out. So, you know, there's all these chances or possibilities that the remedies will be antidoted. This is one of the reasons I like putting remedies in solution and giving them on a daily basis and succussing between each of the doses, because that uh, minimizes the chance of, uh, of an antidote somewhere in the environment. What else could I tell you? I would, I would just say really study it hard and take it seriously and really think about the service that you're doing for your patients. You know, you should love your patients. That's the bottom line. You should care about them so much that you, that you you have a burning desire to help them. Uh, I think that, you know, uh, Herbert Roberts in the introduction to the art and cure of homeopathy has this wonderful passage. He says, you know, you don't, you don't study and practice homeopathy because you want to make a lot of money or you want to have a, a big status in society. You do it because you have a burning desire to help others. And if you have that, you know, all the other things will come along. You will be acknowledged. You will make a decent living in life. All those things will happen naturally, but it won't be because you're trying to make money or because you're trying to be a big guy. It'll happen because you're doing good work in the world. You're, you're doing the good. And that's always the key for me. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, that was one of my questions um, or thoughts was uh, how to keep in contact with people because you can say, hey, uh, Okay, so lasagna, 1984, great advice, thank you. And uh, Ruby as well, that's great advice. And uh, does, the, does lasagna 1984 make good lasagna? Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'd like to know. <laughs> lasagna, is that true? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we're waiting, we're waiting. Okay, yes. Oh, good, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, actually that was one of my thoughts because sometimes, uh, yeah, how could, okay, this is a, Right. But how can, so I'll, I'll go with my quick question. Um, sometimes you really, you can tell people to reach out, but they, they won't definitely. So maybe that's a, an idea to put a little reminder to reach out from time to time with patients that you are concerned about, even though they seem to be okay. Uh, maybe, you know, I'm not sure, you know, how to, how to um, do that. Just because sometimes people move on like, oh, I don't want to work on that. That's okay. And you're like, Okay. I see somebody put a question about boundaries. I mean, I think that's something to also consider as well. You do sometimes need to, you know, if somebody is um, really being overly uh, inappropriate in terms of their contacting you, then you need to say something, you know. I, I, I try to give my patients as much leeway as possible. And for the most part, I don't have much of an issue. People write to me when they need to speak with me. Uh, they're usually very respectful. Every once in a while, you'll come across somebody who is very, very needy and wants all of your attention and energy. But, you you know, the bottom line is you have to realize that this is a suffering person. And the reason that they're, they're asking for help is because they're, they're having a difficult time in life. And um, so I would rather be a giving person than a stingy person. I, I know that if I'm giving and uh, really servicing others, that I'm going to be happy in life. And that's uh, that's the key for me. Great. And that was an excellent question. Thank you, Colleen. 
Uh, yeah, so yeah, they're just, um, oh, beautiful. Okay, great. It, yes, it was. Um, and then, it, yeah, being service to others and, and understanding is distress. I always go, and I can go back to your mother again. You know, it's, it's people. <laughs> people are not, my, my mother was the greatest gift in my life because she taught me compassion and tolerance. If I could deal with my mom, I could deal with anybody. I could show, I could understand anybody's suffering. Look at my mom. Was she a bad person? No, she, she was in a state of mistunement of her life force, fair stimmen of her life force. And when she got the right thing that she needed and came back into a state of balance, she was actually a very lovely human being. So, you know, that's a perfect lesson for me. Great. And I couldn't agree more. So let's go on to our next question is, you know, we're just away for a little a step away from your exciting new project that I really can't wait to talk about. But this is one that's close to my own heart. And I think you've already, you know, kind of answered it, but if you could go into it again, what do you think homeopaths can do to help strengthen homeopathy around the world? Well, again, I'll just say again, to really master the art and science of homeopathy so that they are effective practitioners. And when they get good results, those good results spread to other people. I don't advertise, you know, I just get results with my patients and those patients are happy with those results and they tell their friends and family members about it. And that's where I get my patients. So I think that's a wonderful way to network homeopathy. Um, of course, we do need to, you know, use other techniques as well. And that's one of the reasons this kind of segues into the project that we're going to talk about, which is my film. And uh, I'm I'm really certain that this film will make a big difference for homeopathy because it's being produced at a, at a very high level. You know, it'll be beautiful, like artistry. Like, I don't know if people have seen the documentary uh, called uh, Fantastic Fungi, but it will have that level of beauty. Um, it's got incredible interviews. But it's not going to be just talking heads. Yeah, we've got we've interviewed I think sixty or seventy people now, medical doctors, doctors of veterinary medicine, PhDs. But it won't be just a bunch of talking heads. It'll it'll really be a story about the current situation that we find ourselves in. Because if you walk out into any metropolitan uh, city street these days, you're going to see homelessness. You're going to see people suffering. You're going to see drug abuse, the opioid crisis. You're going to see the hospitals overflowing with people with all kinds of different health issues. Well, homeopathy offers a solution to all that. I, I know you're, some of you are thinking homelessness. Well, how does it address homelessness? Well, there's a, a lady by the name of Wanda Smith Schick working down in the Bay Area, and she's working with homeless people. And they, they treat people for free using homeopathy, and they're getting amazing results. And we actually interviewed three of her patients who were homeless who received homeopathic treatment, and it so helped them that they were able to, to get out of their pattern of, of living on the streets, find subsidized housing, and be able to really find a life for themselves. And this demonstrates the power of homeopathy. So it can even deal with things like homelessness or you know, drug addiction or all kinds of different health issues that people are experiencing today. It can change their lives like it did for my mom or my daughter where they become different people and they can begin to do service in the world themselves. You know, Hahnemann in the author's preface to chronic diseases explains what aphorism nine means, the lofty goal of human existence. It says, if I did not know for what purpose I was put here on earth to make better everything around me, then I would have kept Belladonna a secret during the scarlet fever epidemic of 1799. So even he understood that the purpose, you know, that he was doing God's work in the world. That's what homeopathy is. It's a gift from God. It's a Renaissance science that allows us to use this principle of nature, similia similibus, to basically help people get out of their pattern of suffering, whether that's physical disease or mental disease or emotional disease. And if you can do that, you can transform the world. Yeah, it's not the only thing that's going that we need to do to, to to bring a brighter future for the next generation but it's it's a piece of it it's something that we can do right now and so i think people need to go out there and master this art and science they need to be able to practice with as many patients as they can help as many people as they can and then do whatever else they can to market and promote and help people become more aware of this incredible science that's been around for you know quite a long period of time now and that is you know cheap uh, um, very effective if, if properly employed and uh, something that, you know, can spread throughout the world and make a real difference. Beautiful. And I, I couldn't agree more. Yes, I'm, I could go on about it, but I, I won't. Homelessness, you end up on the streets for a reason. And 
homeopathy can help with those underlying causes, thankfully, right, to, to overcome what they've, what's they what been blocking them from being able to move on and, and seek help and get help and, and, and move on to a better quality of life and off the street. So that's amazing. I so look forward to seeing this film. Now, I wanted to find out how many people are involved in the project. Are you still looking for talent in terms of crew, producers, et cetera, or how are you doing? Well, that's a great question. You know, um, just so you know, the, the film title is a working title. We're not, we haven't set on that as the final title. So right now we're calling it Introducing Homeopathy. And, but I didn't want this film to be just my voice. I wanted it to be the voice of the entire profession. And so early on, we asked a number of people to join as collaborators, the National Center for Homeopathy, for example, Americans for Homeopathy Choice um, uh, uh, with um, uh, Paula Brown, um, uh, Wanda Smith, uh, um, I'm sorry, Kathleen Shibley, um, uh, uh, Denise Strages and Alistair Gray, Robert Mello. We invited a whole group, about 15, 16. And actually, we've added four or five new ones on. Rachel Roberts wants to join. Um, uh, Carl Robinson is participating. So there's, there's about 20 of us right now. And the, the value of this is that uh, people can review each cut and say, you know, that doesn't quite work. Or let's try to think about this. Or, you know, if you get 20 creative people together, you know, who have a vested interest in making this film excellent, then you're going to produce something that one person by themselves is not capable of accomplishing. So we've got about 20 collaborators right now, and we're always looking for more people who've got something to offer to join us. Uh, we've got about five, six, seven current volunteers, but we've got another 20 waiting in the wings who have offered various different types of services. We have an auction coming up on uh, November 15th, where we're auctioning off all these items to help raise funds for the film. Um, when we went to interview Richard Pitcairn, who, by the way, did an amazing job. Uh, he was just absolutely excellent. His wife, Susan Pitcairn, uh, is an artist, a fairly well-known, acclaimed artist. And she does amazing paintings. And she agreed to paint a portrait of Samuel Hahnemann and donate it for the auction on November 15th uh, to help us again raise funds. So we've got, you know, people from all everywhere, you know, uh, the National Center for Homeopathy is letting us use their 5013C status, their not-for-profit status to receive uh, tax deductible donations. So really the entire homeopathic community has come together, has recognized the importance of this project and has really been collaborating to help us um, make it a reality. Uh, we have, of course, the entire Whole Health Now staff that's working on this project, my webmaster, my operations manager. My wife is in indentured servitude at the moment. Um, so, uh, and, you know, but there's been so many people who've come forth and offered their services. Uh, and then, of course, we've got the filmmaker himself, Julian. And that's a great story because, you know, I, I just found Julian through the Internet and they, I asked him to make some short videos for another project we were working on. And I was so impressed with the quality of videos that I thought, wow, why not make a documentary film about homeopathy with this gentleman? He's got the requisite skills to do it, which I don't have, you know, but I know enough about homeopathy to, and enough people in homeopathy to bring it together. Um, and But the great thing about Julian is his father is an acupuncturist. And so he's extremely sympathetic to energetic medicine and to natural medicine. And he's he's doing this film for us at a fraction of what it should cost. It should probably cost four to five times oh, wow. what, what we're costing. And that's because he's so personally enthusiastic about the project. He's got he's really totally committed to it. As a matter of fact, he he he's so committed to it that he decided to be treated homeopathically because he felt that was the only way for him to really put himself completely into the film. So we have a real gift here, you know, the whole homeopathic community coming together, everyone wanting to collaborate in this film, and a filmmaker who's got amazing skills, who's personally invested in the project. I mean, I, I can't think of a better scenario than that. I think him volu Julian volunteering to actually go into treatment, homeopathic treatment, is the uh, the best um, the best part of it, just because you really need to know, you have to experience it to understand just how powerful it is. Yeah. For, unfortunately, he got a really good revenue with amazing results. So that was a really good thing, too. There was a lot riding on it. Yeah. He <laughs> said, hey, what is this stuff? You know, it doesn't work. But right, but he, he had an ama amazing response to the remedy he took. And so, and so this is for all listeners. 
And the reason for that is getting back to the basics, going back and reading the masters and honing our skills so that we can we can deliver it as, as much as possible. I think uh, I think honestly, that was my favorite uh, part from uh, tonight, even more than the film is, is, uh, you know, how can we how can we be the best that we can be and help more people? But I will ask one more film question. Um, so can we donate? So November the 15th is the auction, which will be exciting. And I hope people will be able to go to that page and and, uh, and contribute. And I will actually post, so I'm going to repost this uh, interview on Rumble over the next few days. And I will add all of the links. Uh, Kim, maybe you can send them to me for donations and everything else that you want to include uh, for the for the movie. I think this is fantastic. And I really uh, think it's there's no more of an appropriate time than right now for this. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that completely. Uh, if people want to make a don financial donation to the to the film, it's it's greatly appreciated. We've raised, um, as of this month, a little over one hundred thirty five thousand dollars. Our goal is two hundred fifty thousand dollars, so we're more than a halfway there right now, and um, we're continuing to receive support from all different uh, organizations and individuals within the homeopathic community. So I'm very confident that we'll reach those goals. But of course, we welcome uh, any funds that people can can donate. Uh, also, if you want to go, I think I don't know if the link is at the top of the the page yet, but um, the fundraising webpage, it's being redone right now, but the fundraising webpage is introducinghomeopathy.com. I'll repeat that again. It's introducinghomeopathy.com. And there should be, in the next day or two, a link at the very top that will uh, lead to the auction website where you can see, I think there'll be about, excuse me, <coughs> there'll be about um, 30 or 35 different items for auction including uh, um, admission to the upcoming Joint American Homeopathic Conference in San Antonio, Texas. We'll be there showing clips of the film. I re highly recommend to go to the JHC if you can. Uh, there's also software donated by Zomio, all kinds of different software courses. Uh, <laughs> excuse me. And there's even that course I mentioned earlier, the George Yurge course, which is, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, so I don't know why I'm sneezing, but uh, anyway, uh, so there's a lot of different things up there that are available, really wonderful yeah. items uh, for remedy kits, all kinds of things. Fantastic. Do you have a, a short clip or something that you could show us? Yeah, clip? yeah. Let me go ahead and try to show, uh, if I could, I could show a couple of short clips that are kind of fun. They're very, very short. Uh, okay. All right, so hopefully this works. All right. So uh, we want to explain what is homeopathy. Can you see my screen? I will bring it on. Here we go. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So we wanted to explain, you know, what what is homeopathy. And uh, we had the idea to, when we were in Philly, to just go out onto the streets and ask people what they thought homeopathy was all about. And we even went in front of the University of Medi University of Pennsylvania Medical School and asked people in their scrubs as well what homeopathy was. And so this is a little short video that we created uh, to give you a sense of the type of answers we got out there and kind of a little self-promotion within the homeopathic community. So I'll go ahead and show you this first. Oh, I don't have sound. We don't have sound. I'll stop and start sharing again. Let me see. Um, okay, present. Share screen. Now I am selecting share system audio. So maybe it's because I need to share. Can you see my screen now? I can. Okay, so let's hope that. Uh... Okay, let's try it now. I'll try it one more time. And no, I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, we can't hear anything on this end, unfortunately. 
Okay, you know, uh, these uh, a lot of these clips are at introducinghomeopathy.com, so I don't know why it doesn't share, but um, they can go to introducinghomeopathy.com, and we'll be posting more videos up there all the time for people to check out as well. Great, and I've included the link in the chat, and I'll include it as well when I post this to Rumble, so that'll be uh, very exciting. And I do want to have you back just, you know, once you're um, coming towards the end and it's about ready to launch to discuss it in more detail, that'd be lovely if you could. And um, I want to thank you. If, you. if there's anything else that you'd like to bring up at this time, let me know. Any, any. Well, I just want to thank you for putting yourself out and doing this. You're doing a wonderful job and it's a real service and I appreciate spending the time with you. So, and I want to just thank everyone who was on this call and, um, you know, go out there and do the good work of the world. That's what we need right now. Thank you, Kim. I really want to thank you for for uh, being available to to start uh, to be my very first interview. I was so excited that uh, you're available, and uh, uh, you know, full disclosure, I've uh, Kim taught some of the classes when I was in school, and I always found his classes insightful, and that's why I thought I really want Kim Ali to be on. And uh, so I'm really happy. Thank you that you're able to come for and and uh, be my very first interview. And, and um, thank you uh, again. It's my, it's my honor. My honor. Oh, thank you, Kim. You're too, you're too wonderful. I hope you, um, everybody, thank you for coming and watching. I really appreciate everybody who's able to, to sh come here and uh, thank you, all of you. Um, I really appreciate it. I, I love the fact that um, you're able to participate in the chat and ask questions and uh, I hope you all have a wonderful night and I will um, end, end this broadcast soon. And, and uh, Kim, I'll say my goodbyes to you after we close out of the broadcast. Again, thank you so much, everybody, for coming, and I hope you have a wonderful evening. Take care. Bye, everyone.